Welcome to Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. It's awesome to see so many people in the audience. Thanks for coming. I'm Dan Hunt. I'm the Division Director for Hospital Medicine. Twice a year, we invite a visiting professor to come teach us, learn with us, and inspire us. And it's an incredible privilege to have Dr. Gurpreet Dhaliwal visit with us the last two days. I need to give some props to folks in our division. Aaron Kim, raise your hand, yeah. has organized this visit and done great work with that. So thanks to Aaron. Dustin Smith, who leads our Education Council, has been in charge of these sessions as well and has done great work. Dr. Dollywall told me I am not allowed to say a whole lot about it. <laughs> He's a professor of medicine at University of California, San Francisco. He is a program director for the medical students at the VA. He is a clinician who spends almost all of his time seeing patients, both in the inpatient environment and in the outpatient environment of the emergency room. I will say one more thing about him. Though. Yeah. I think it was in 2012 that the New York Times posted the question, posed the question of, can a computer outthink this doctor? <laughs> I can tell you the answer to that. From COCO conference yesterday, it's clear computers will never get there. So, <laughs> Dr. Dollywall is gonna teach us about how to go from good to great in clinical reasoning. Goop, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, uh, Dr. Hunt, for that introduction. Thank you, Dr. Kim, also for uh, all the arrangements we've had and the tremendous visit here. And I want to thank everyone for the hospitality. I've really had a tremendous uh, visit, which is still ongoing now. But as Dr. Hunt alluded to, sort of at the heart of my identity as being a clinician and really being a clinician and a teacher. Um, and when I started my um, medical career almost 20 years ago, I had this sort of singular, rather burning question, which remains today, which is looking at the clinicians that I really admired, like the diagnosticians and the bedside uh, clinicians that I admired, is that how did you get so good? Um, and what I meant by that really was how did they accumulate all the knowledge and wisdom and bedside manner that it takes to do a tremendous job um, as a clinician? Um, and people liked that question, but the response that I got was always the same. They always said, you know, you just got to see a lot of patients and you just got to read a lot. And I thought that was very nice advice, but I said, you know, it's unlikely that that's the answer because all doctors see a lot of patients and all doctors read a lot. Um, there has to be something else um, that accounts for people going not just from good at medicine to being great at it. Um, and I tried to learn where I could from other diagnosticians or other literature what it really takes to sort of reach our maximal potential. And through many examples and a lot of literature, I think there's a path that all of us can follow if we're trying to go on that journey. And there are many role models that we can talk about. I'm going to come back later to these two amazing diagnosticians on this slide here. The answer, and actually it's from a lot of different fields, and how we become great at something is captured on this slide. So this is a time performance curve, and it describes how we get good at anything that we care about. It can be a small skill like learning how to tie a shoe or a knot or something bigger like listening to a heart or putting in a central line or running a family meeting. Whatever the skill is, or even your general domain knowledge, the human brain goes through this path, which is at the very beginning, it's very slow going, sort of trying to get the hang of things. Um, then eventually, it starts to get the hang of it. It's like, all right, I understand this domain I'm working in, and I'm on the steep part of the learning curve. In medical education, this is typically the clerkship years, residency, and then oftentimes the first four to five years when people are in practice. Um, and then what happens when you survey doctors and look at their practice is that for the vast majority of people, after about five years in practice or so, you get comfortable with about 80 or 90 percent of what walks through the door. So it doesn't mean you know everything. It doesn't mean you can handle anything. But a lot of what's coming through is familiar and you're running a f familiar script. And that's a great comforting point you get to and it feels really good. Um, the problem is that that uh, comforting point comes with a price. Uh, and the price is that as the amount of challenges per day starts to decrease as you get comfortable with your job, then the amount of learning per day starts to decrease. And as the amount of learning per day starts to decrease, then your rate of performance increase starts to flatten out. And you're getting a little better, but you're just getting a little better day after day, week after week. 
And if we follow in that pattern sort of day after day, week after week, month after month, we are on our way to becoming what the literature calls an experienced professional. And make no mistake about it, an experienced professional is terrific. You do great service to your patients. You do great service to the next generation you're training, the teams that you're working with. Uh, you really do a service to everyone. But it's conceivable that the only person you may be shortchanging if you settle for that uh, is that you might be shortchanging yourself. Because what you do if you're only going to be experienced in a field is that you're not going for excellence or expertise. Or really what's best said is saying achieving your own maximal potential. So if you look at a curve like this, this is not meant to be two docs. It's not meant to be two docs in comparison, although it's conceivable that it could be. But there's a lot of lessons to be uh, gleaned from this. One of it is that experience does count. Time does matter. So it shouldn't be a surprise that someone who's in their second year on the job may not be as good as someone who's in their 10th year on the job. But you don't want to make the mistake that that's a foregone conclusion. But the one, that, and the other thing that I think you really have to think about a lot when you look at a curve like this is that just because you do something for a long time doesn't make you great at it. It's so important, it's worth uh, reemphasizing. Just because I do something for a long time doesn't make me great at it, right? Uh, you know, um, and you can think of anything that you've been doing for a long period of time, right? I've been uh, typing ever since I'm in middle school, but it's not like anyone wants me to be sort of a transcriptionist, right? I would be terrible at it. Or I've been driving ever since I'm in high school, but even with three decades under my belt, it's not like NASCAR is coming to my house and saying, hey, we heard you've been driving for a long time. Um, or I've been a parent, and I, I have two boys, and they're teenagers, and I have two boys, and I, I really love those two kids to death. Um, but it's not like either one of those two worthless boys nominates me for parent of the year <laughs> after all these years. And I think that's fine, because I think they understand uh, that just because I've done it for a long time doesn't make me great at it. And when you study people who do something for a long time, what you'll recognize is that when something gets easy, as soon as it gets easy, they take that liberated mental energy and they reinvest it back into their craft. And we don't have a lot of studies of how this is done in medicine, but there's studies in many other fields that we can adapt to our own practice and develop a training program where you commit to sort of lifelong excellence and really a, a notion that if I'm going to be a lifelong learner, I have to create a training program for myself that it starts in med school and residency, but then continues well beyond. And the purpose of this talk is to draw insights from them and apply them to our own practice. Well, I went back to what people's advice was. They're like, you know, see a lot of patients and read a lot. And there's no doubt, whatever I tell you in this hour, that the core curriculum for your career is the patients that you're going to see. That is at the heart of what we do. And I recognize there must be something that can be done then to get more out of it. And there are, there's research that spans decades ago that actually tells us there are certain people who get more out of the raw material that's put in front of them in their cases. And the first insight where this came from was in teachers. This was done almost three decades ago from Breiter and Scardamelia. And they were looking at how do you become an expert teacher. And they recognized that in any domain, in any single career, really what you're trying to do is go through a to-do list. So for a physician, there's a to-do list. If I want to be a generalist physician, things on my to-do list are sort of you know, monocular blindness and monoarthritis and jaundice and anemia. Those are all to-dos that I have to learn about. And teaching is no different. And they studied the teachers who were on their career trajectories. And they said they're working through their to-do list as well. Like, how do I create a lesson plan? How do I discipline a child? Um, how, do I give, uh, how do I interact with parents, for instance? And the, what they observed is all teachers care about getting better at that. And they get better and better. And then they get to a point where they're like, I got it. And they check that off their to-do list. And just like everyone else, it feels really good to check something off your to-do list. But that's when they noticed the difference. They said the majority of teachers are humans, and they check things off their to-do list, and they say, I got the hang of this, and they sort of constrain the work that they have to do. But they said there's a subset of teachers who check something off their to-do list. They have this momentary sort of glow that we all get with saying, I got this. Um, and then they put something right back on the top of their to-do list. So they might say something like, OK, I know how to discipline a child. Now I need to get better at disciplining a child who has special needs. Um, I've gotten the hang of how I talk with parents. Now I have to work on my skills of talking with parents who have English as a second language. Um, I know how to make a lesson plan. Is my lesson plan good enough that a substitute teacher could walk into this classroom and pick up where I left off yesterday? Um, and make no mistake about it, teachers are like doctors or all other human beings. If they have to learn it, they will. But there's a subset of people who are motivated to prepare their mind in advance of that problem coming. And you can start to adapt that and think about how you might uh, see that in our day-to-day -day life. You know, you might take a very common thing that we might see in general medicine, like someone comes in with a red swollen leg. 
And I might exhibit the behavior of an experienced physician. I might say, you know, it's, it's a red leg. Um, I'm worried about cellulitis. I'm going to rule out DVT. Um, uh, maybe it's venous stasis, um, but I will get an ultrasound. If it's neg, I'll give my familiar antibiotic and I'll send the patient on the way. And that's great. That's experienced care. I've done really well for my patient. The learner who's with me may have uh, picked up a thing or two, and that's terrific. That's experience, and that's awesome. The person who's striving for expertise would do all that same stuff with the same efficiency, but then she'd create some micro challenge for herself. She'd be like, all right, I went through the differential, and it could be venous stasis or um, DVT or it could be cellulitis, but what if it's none of those three? Is there one or two other things I can just challenge myself with right now? Or, you know, I'm going to be at the staff meeting at noon, and I'm going to be sitting next to the ID attending. I'm going to ask her if she agrees with me not covering MRSA because it doesn't seem like I needed to, but I want to hear if someone else thought the same way about the case. Or clinic super busy today. If I had my student with me and I was running from that room to the next, what are two on-the-fly teaching points I want to have preloaded so I'd be ready to give them in case that day ever comes? And that behavior of sort of prepping the mind in a sort of micro-learning way is something that you see in people who are preparing themselves to do their best, if not today, for the next day that follows. And that's what happened in a study that Joan Sargent did uh, almost 15 years ago of the highest performing physicians uh, in Nova Scotia. One of the things that, um, and these were the physicians who were defined as highest performing by 360 degree assessments. They were family physicians and they were incredibly busy. And I want to point out that thing because oftentimes when people see high performing behaviors, what they say is, well, if they had my practice or if they knew how busy I was, you'd recognize how hard it is. But oftentimes what these studies show is it's the busiest people who find a way to work it into the routine. And she found in these very high performing physicians that they absolutely cared about the patient in front of them. They put all their energy in there. But they sort of had a two-track mind, um, that they were focusing on the patient, but they were always focusing on the next version of this patient and how they might get better. And you can imagine that what their skill really was was seeing the non-routine and the routine cases that they see. So for instance, this is a patient that we had uh, who had a GI bleed, and they came in with an upper GI bleed, and they looked like they had end-stage liver disease. And in many ways, that's a familiar script to run for a lot of clinicians. So you can complete, treat that as a normal day at the office. Um, but then a subset of people will say, you know, there are some things in that case that I don't really know as well as I thought I did. Like, I don't really have a good handle on why the platelets would be over a million. So I, I think it's that disease, essential thrombocytosis. But then they would read and learn, out, learn that infinitely more common is that it's actually a reactive thrombocytosis. Or there might be a curiosity of why the PTT is elevated, even though the person's not on an anticoagulant, and how that may come into it. Or they may find vocabulary, like, I keep getting myelo. What is the difference in you know, myelofibrosis and myelodysplasia and myelopathy? What is with that prefix? And they try to learn something on that. And they have this habit of finding learning, even if the challenge wasn't presented to them in the moment. And everyone has their style of doing this. You know, one of the things that I have found um, that I find really easy to do is not to have a fantasy that later I'm going to pull an article on something to read. I have the moment, I try to identify where is the margin of my knowledge. And if I could just upload one or two facts that either help me with this case or honestly will help me with a harder version of this in the future, I may be able to do a better job with a patient like this and certainly will be able to do that with the patient who's next to me. What I want you to do is just take one minute, 60 seconds, and say, is there anything that you do to create micro challenges in your job? And I mean micro. Micro challenges in your job when none exist in that moment, but you're interested and you're preparing your mind for a little harder version in the future. So just spend 60 seconds with your neighbor and then we'll carry on. How do you create micro challenges in your clinical world? <laughs>
All right, let's come back together. There will be other opportunities to get to know your neighbor. So I hope you like who you're, I hope you like who you're sitting next to. <laughs> um, so so I, I want to, I really do want to, I don't know how to whistle, sorry. If I could whistle, I would. Your attention, please. Um, that, that you really want to think about this habit of like making your life just a little bit harder than it needs to be in the moment because the dividends are there. And the, the point about small and micro alerting is hard to emphasize. You know, it's a little bit of cognitive science, but it's also a bit of economics. We're really talking compound interest here that uh, if you have slight inflection point on that curve of learning, it builds up day after day. This is the way the human memory works, just like a bank account does. Um, and the key point about this, whether you reflect on your own practice or those, those high performing physicians in the study, like the one I mentioned, is this, is our patients are our curriculum. Um, and you're never in charge of what walks in the clinic or what walks in the emergency room or what walks in the ward. You absolutely have zero control over that. Um, the only thing you're really in control of uh, is the amount of learning that you get out of it. Um, so you remember earlier I mentioned there's a, there's, very, there's a great importance in having role models or people that we aspire to. And I, I showed you two amazing diagnosticians uh, at the beginning of the uh, talk. Um, if you didn't recognize them from that photo reel, you may recognize them in their office. Because the, the two people I was talking about are diagnosticians of a different ilk than the type you might see walking around here. Um, they, are, they are generalists. Uh, they get incredibly difficult cases presented to them. They work super fast, just like docs. They have to see five or six cases in a given hour. Um, and then there's these things about these two diagnosticians that you just got to love. Like they work in a team. They do second opinions on each other. And probably the most important thing is that they love their job because they laugh a lot. <laughs> Um, and if you don't recognize who they are in this office, I'll tell you that these are two brothers, Tom and Ray, or Click and Clack, the Tappert brothers, who for over 40 years on national public radio answered any and every type of car dilemma, diagnostic almost always, that you can ever imagine. Can I see just by a show of hands how many people have heard the show Car Talk? If you have not, it is a model of clinical reasoning. And you can uh, download their podcast on any given week. They're now, um, they're now archived and learn really how diagnosticians uh, really cone their craft. And they have everything. Their job is very much like a doc. You know, what a mechanic does is exactly what a doc does. Someone brings this super complicated uh, machine into the shop. Like, they don't understand how it works. They describe it in layperson's terms. Probably all of us are thinking of ourselves. Uh, and then you really just have two questions, which is like, how much does this cost, and is everything going to turn out OK? And it's very much like the same thing that a patient comes to us with when they give, bring their problems. And the things that they do are just like it. You know, people get, come in with routine problems. Like people may say, you know, uh, the brakes are making a squeaking sound. And they say, don't you worry about that. You just have to fix the calipers or the brake pads. Sometimes they don't know how to describe the problem, so they give sounds. So they might say, like, you know, a car makes a thunk and a meow sound, and I'm on a country road. And you'll see them sort of like trying to think it through. And they'd say, on that old model, I'd adjust your carburetor, and I'd look for your cat. And they'll look for that. <laughs> <laughs> and then the things, their job, if you listen to it, is exactly like ours. They get all of these sort of existential questions around cars, which we also get too. We're like, it's not quite in our scope as docs, but we'll do our best. Like uh, one of the, Many years ago, one of my favorite challenges they got was someone was asking about the carpool lane. And she said, is it OK if I drive in the carpool lane if I'm alone, uh, but I'm pregnant? And they, you saw as they went through the machination, just like all things, they didn't quite have the right answer, but you said they did their very best. Um, and the key thing is that when you really listen to them when they go into a discourse, of course, we, we want to know their smarts and the challenge like that. But if you listen very closely, you'll recognize one thing, which is they care more about the person um, than they do about the car. And when we talk about this journey to diagnostic excellence and clinical reasoning excellence, we have to make sure that we keep track of that. Now, there's another very apt metaphor in our journey for achieving clinical reasoning excellence, uh, and it relates to driving. So just like our job is like a mechanic, a lot of our learning is, is related to cars as well. Um, does anyone uh, know what percentage of Americans think they're an above average driver? Like if you ask people and say, where do they rate themselves? <laughs> what percentage of people think they're above average? Yeah, it's, it's, unfortunately, I think this is with, with uh, regret, many people are saying it's roughly in the 80 to 85 percent. When you see surveys, it's a very interesting number because it also comes up when doctors are surveyed. Like, what percentage of your, uh, where do you rank in hypertension control in your panel compared to other people? Or LDL control, we used to measure that compared to other people. And it's very frequent that people self assess themselves at sort of the 80 to 85 percent rate. And it's hard to know exactly what's going on there. People are probably like, well, 
truthfully, I'm really awesome, but it'd be conceited to say 99%. So I'm going to dial it down a little bit and say something that maybe sounds a little more modest, but I'm not going to 50. Um, but the truth is, of course, everyone can't be above average. So you might say, well, why is it that sort of our self-assessment of activities like that rate out at the 80 to 85%? It's this Lake Wobegon, an impossible effect. Um, and it relates to the task of driving. You see, every day you drive to and from work or to and from home or to and from school, and you have no events, right? No ticket no accident, no near miss. What the brain naturally does is it creates a story in your mind. You're like, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty good driver, right? I mean, you do that day after day, week after week, week month after month, and you're like, I am an excellent driver, <laughs> even though we're probably uh, just an uh, experienced driver. Um, but that starts to change when people put this in their car. So when you put something like this in people's car, this is called a drive cam, and there's many of other models like that, what people start to see is things like you know the yellow light I thought I was running. Turns out that was red. Um, when I swerved into a lane and it seemed like there was no big deal, that worked out really well. The snapshot they took of the picture behind me and the gesture of his hand, this is the family version here, tells me maybe I cut it a little close. If I was talking on my cell phone like I always do when I'm driving, it's no big deal. I'm quite good at it, even when I took that turn. Nothing at all. And it's true, it was nothing at all to me. Um, but it was to the little girl who was just a meter away on her bike, and I almost missed it. And when people see that kind of feedback, what happens is they take their normal estimation of 80 to 85% and they lower it more to the 50 to 60% range. Um, but there's another thing that happens too, which is people get motivated to become better at driving, something that they've been doing for years and years on end. If you look at models for how doctors work, we have a tremendous thing of what's called uh, decision density, the number of decisions that we make per time. But the amount of feedback we get on that is remarkably small. So as Dr. Hunt mentioned, I work in ER and urgent care. So in a given day, I might see 15 patients, 20 patients. Um, and as I go through that, you know, I might see someone who's very routine, like a, a young man who has a fever and some cervical lymphadenopathy. And I might say to him, listen, don't you worry about a thing. This thing's just a viral URI. You're going to be just fine. Uh, and if it winds up being a viral URI, and I learned that because um, you know, I see his PMD, or I, I check the EMR, or the VA is a closed system, and I run into the same people all the time, I'll be like, all right, note to self, the next time the brain sees that same problem, proceed in that way. But if I tell him, don't you worry about a thing, you just have a viral URI, you're going to be great. Um, and then I learn by those same methods, either seeing him on my inpatient duties, talking to his uh, PMD or maybe checking in the EMR that actually that was his index presentation of his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and I missed it. Um, I have the chance if I want to go back and say, you know, was there something in that process that I missed? Could I have improved my decision making? Like, you know, now that I think about it, those are rather big lymph nodes or why didn't I examine any other lymph node beds or, you know, he said he lost weight and I congratulated on him, but really like no one can lose weight. I should have, I should have thought that's a red flag. There's something going on here and I should have at least dug deeper before I uh, stuck out my hand in congratulations. But for the huge number of patients that I don't learn what happens, and my number is huge, but so is yours because we do all these things like rotate on and off service, people leave our healthcare system, things go from the inpatient to outpatient. The number is innumerable. For the huge number of patients where we don't know what happens to them, what do you think the human mind does? It has to do something with those outcomes. So what do you think it does? Where does it, where does it categorize it? Yeah, so some people think it's like a poof, it goes away. That would be ideal, but the problem is that's not the way the brain works. The way the brain works is it operates under a no news is good news phenomenon. So I may think I did an amazing job with that person in urgent care a couple weeks ago, um, even though he's across the way at the hospital getting his first round of chemotherapy. And if I proceed in that way, what happens is that the patients, they're definitely getting a more confident doctor. As my years accumulate, they're getting a more and more confident doctor. Uh, but without tracking their outcomes, I can't guarantee that I'm giving them a more competent doctor. And that's really uh, what they deserve. Um, now, when I look over the years, you know, I start to see incredibly creative ways that people track their patients. Some people do it on Post-it notes. Some people do it on Excel spreadsheets. Some people have black books. It's migrated now to EMRs. Some people use their uh, electronic devices. And I don't think you have to be proscriptive in that how you do it. 
But I think there's little grounds to be proscriptive in that you do it because there's a tremendous amount of learning uh, when you develop this habit. And I developed this habit not actually in my day job, but it was years ago when I did moonlighting for a long period of time when I was early on faculty. And what I learned was that it wasn't the rare or exotic cases that I was getting wrong. I mean, make no mistake, I'm an internist. I would track, like, you know, is this a pheochromocytoma or mastocytosis? Like, I love that dilemma. But it was the much more common things, like um, call, giving vancomycin to someone's red leg, but it was really just venous stasis, or um, thinking that someone had a heart attack, but it was just heartburn. And both of those are fair mistakes, but I want to make those less and less and less. And honestly, those common things are the things that patients want me to deliver on. I, not too many people are counting on me to get pheo versus masto right, but a ton of people are counting on me to get red leg right or chest pain right. And so I learned those are the things that I needed to track. So I want you to spend two minutes with your neighbor and in a similar fashion to the way you talked about microlearning before, think about your clinical practice now and say, is there anything that you do now to track your cases? Uh, and if you do do it, is it successful? Do you remind yourself to do it? Do you get learning out of it? Um, everyone has their own way to do it, but you gotta have some way to do it. So turn to your neighbor and say, how do you track your cases and how do you learn from those outcomes? All right, let's come back together. Um, again, and what, there's, no one, oh, there's no one way to do this. In fact, I'm struck by the creativity. Some people do it electronic, some do it paper, some make it a solo venture, some do it with their group, some do it with one partner, some do it with the whole group of people in the group. But there's many, many ways, and there's so many virtues to it. One of the things is if you do do it, you wind up talking to other people about cases. And oftentimes we're trying to figure out like what's one of the ways to get the joy in medicine back. And one of the great ones is actually talking to our colleagues about the cases we have. But, and when you do feedback, make, make no mistake, it's, it's, not a, it's not mostly mistakes, it's actually mostly successes. What you learn is a lot of the times you're like, this is what I thought would happen and this is what did happen. Or I thought this was the best course for the patient and happily that's what happened, so I want to proceed in that way. But there's no shortage of lessons that, that come through this method. Um, and you don't just need to take my word for it. Um, it turns out that the guys on Car Talk do the exact same thing. So if people who raise their hands are fans of the show, um, you will know that periodically they have this section called Stump the Chumps. Uh, and in Stump the Chumps, what they do is they go back and they check their work. They literally call people up and they say, how was our advice? Like, how did things turn out? They even put their scorecard on the web uh, for everyone to see. And it covers the whole gamut, right? Whether it's simple stuff like, you know, uh, did you get a little more pep in your engine after you swapped out those spark plugs? Uh, if it's simple stuff like that, or if it's the complex stuff, you know, um, oftentimes if you know the show, they oftentimes dispense life advice. And they're like, listen, I want to know how that goes. They'll be like, you know, did you dump that worthless boyfriend like we told you to? Like whatever it is that they chose to give it for advice, they want to know how the story ends. And so I want you to not take my word for it, but take their best practice for it as well. And I got 
rather say this, it is, it's time consuming. You have to create a workflow and you have to create a habit. Those are the two things that you need to do. And oftentimes it's said you have to do something for 21 days straight before it becomes a habit. So set the reminder on your phone, but do it for 21 days straight. So it, it's a, a good amount of work. Um, but I have to tell you without a doubt, um, it is the greatest form of CME you will ever, ever engage in. So as I, you know, you start to get insights from some fields where you see how people sharpen their minds and prepare their brains for the future, you recognize that there's some core habits. And if my curriculum, uh, well after school and residency is done, is my cases, there are some things I can do to quote unquote, see more cases, just like my mentors told me, but there's a way to see them, which is finding a little more learning in them and then finding a chance to revisit for two things, to see how the story ends and also to give my brain a second touch point with the case. Because as I'll talk about in a second, the brain oftentimes is not charitable to something it only seems once in terms of keeping it. Um, but as I started to see it, my patients as a real great source of joy, but also a source of learning, I started to recognize, and I think everyone does too, who pays attention to their environment, that there's, there's room around to learn even more. Um, and one of the things I recognize is that almost always we're on some sort of team where other colleagues are taking care of the patients. It can be on my inpatient team where there's two interns who have a split service and an AI who has a third. It can be in my ER where I work where we're all running around taking care of patients but we're hearing, hearing about other people's cases. It can be in the clinic precepting room where people are discussing cases back and forth. And there's this rich milieu around you if you want to pay attention to it where you can get a whole nother series of cases where you can learn from. And the beauty of those cases that I'm mentioning, like with your co-intern or your colleague or someone else, is that they're doing all the work, but you can get all the learning. Oh, the only thing you have to have is the notion of a little bit of curiosity to say, tell me about that case, or actually, I'm going to follow up on your patient's case because I find it as curious as you do, and we're going to talk about it, or I'm going to read up on it, even though you're dealing with the real life issue. But it's there for the learning. You just have to decide if you want to take it. And there's another layer that's pure gold, which is if you're in an environment where other clinicians and great cases are happening, but they're not proximate, they're not the people who are within voice range or team range, but you're in a place like an academic center or a hospital or a practice, very often there's a venue where cases are being discussed. So in an academic place, it might be morning report or M&M. If you're in a uh, community practice or a hospital, it might be peer review. Um, there are places where people get together and talk about cases, um, and that's a potential to learn. And you'll see some people deliberately put themselves in those places. You know, they block out their schedule and they're like, I always go to m and It's a non-negotiable. I'll never, never miss that appointment. Or I put myself on the peer review committee. I, I have tons of things to do, but that's the only way to get a steady steam of cases around me. And they start to see that there's this whole gold, pot of gold in the local cases that they have. And you start to see that you can start to form a curriculum of cases that doesn't just start with the ones I see, but also these layers of ones that are around me. And you can put this practice as a teacher. Like I be believe very strongly in team cases. So people who are on my teams know that, for instance, I have two interns and a sub I, so the three of them split up the service. But the rule is everyone has to know everyone else's cases. There is no, there's no option to say I only know my own patients. You don't have to take care of all of them, but you need to know all the cases because that learning is there for everyone. You triple the learning while one person does the work. Um, and so I started to recognize, you know, this, this thing, and I think other people do too. You're like, there's so many cases, I'm going to try to capture them. This is going to become my learning, and I will uh, go on further and further my knowledge and reasoning and practice. Uh, but the one thing that you start to run into almost immediately is this unfortunate fact. <laughs> So there, uh, in, in the 1800s, uh, Ebbinghaus was a German uh, psychologist, and he studied the human mind, but not how it remembers. He studied the ruthless reality of how it forgets. Um, and what he said is something that we live every day. Every student in here is nodding their head, and every one of us, you'll do this for the rest of your life, which is that when you hear something, there's an immediate sense that I understand this, and I'll be able to keep this forever. But the reality is a lot more difficult than that. And it proves that the, the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve is a universal phenomenon, which is that something that seems incredibly salient and memorable to the brain will soon be edited out if there's no repetition. The brain is a ruthless editor. And when it forgets things, it's usually a gift. Like, I'm so glad that you know, the, my brain didn't keep track of where I parked at Home Depot last week. But I'm kind of bummed that my brain didn't keep track of that pearl I learned from an oncologist last week. Right? That it forgets both of them because it needs to see something again and again. And if you study the forgetting curve, you'll learn that actually it's a natural part of the brain. But the counter, there's only one remedy to it. And it's increasing the amount of exposure that it gets to that same topic. So one part of your training routine is increasing the number of cases you put yourself in front of. But the second part of a training routine is finding ways to keep it in long-term memory and practice with it. And that is where insight comes from another field, which is actually most salient from the world of chess.
So um, chess has sometimes been called the Drosophila of clinical reasoning uh, research. So people may remember the poor fruit flies, Drosophila, I think Melanogaster, or something along those lines. And millions of those were uh, sacrificed so that we could uh, understand how genetics work and that created our field. It turns out when you look at the field of cognitive expertise, the people who have been studied the most have been chess grandmasters. Um, and they have looked at them to say, what are the study habits and training habits that really make them uh, the sharpest in their field, the greatest of the great? And some things that they find uh, you know, are, maybe you could figure out, like for instance, they, they found that many chess grandmasters spend inordinate amount of times in solitary study. Um, and you know, may say, well, okay, it's not exactly a spoiler alert, but like the local chess grandmaster may not be at the bar and he's more likely to be at the library. Like you may say, that's not, that's not like the insight of the century. But the key thing is that not that they're at the library, but it's what they're reading. So you may say, well, what do they read? And it turns out that they spend all of their time studying published chess games. So it's very important, right? They, they're not reading chess review articles. They're not reading randomized control trials in chess. They're not going for evidence-based chess. They actually spend a massive amount of time studying cases. Um, and the reasoning behind it is quite sound, because it's actually what other fields do when they're trying to ch uh, train their sharpest minds. Generals get put through war games. Business leaders go through um, case studies. Because what these chess masters do is this, is they don't read the cases casually. They study them. They go through them move by move, step by step, in an effort to burn the, merle, the neural trace of that game into their long-term memory and grab all the micro challenges that come along with it. So there is a start and there is an end. It's like a pilot in a flight simulator. It matters a lot what the takeoff is. It matters a lot what the landing is. But it's all the curveballs along the way that are the real gold in the flight simulator exercise. And it is not hard to imagine how you can start to adapt this to the world, to the world we live in, right? We have hundreds of cases that get come in your mailbox or your inbox if you so desire. But there's a way to read it that replicates what the chess master does or what the, flight, the pilot in the flight simulator does. And it's not to enjoy the case. It actually has to be turned into sort of a bit of desirable difficulty where you put your brain through the paces. So, and to be fair, a lot of the cases that get published in the medical literature are very odd and unusual. This one um, shows, is a 25-year-old man who comes into the hospital and has a cardiac arrest. And in the end, um, it actually winds up being intestinal schistosomiasis, and he has a very unfortunate outcome. And I think people start to see cases like this, and they say, like, it's not really worth my time to read these unusual or esoteric cases uh, in these journals because this is the kind of stuff you run into. I'm probably not going to run into this uh, in my practice. And that's a totally fair conclusion. That's right. The chance that you'll run into this is relatively slim. Uh, the problem is there's tons of gold in this article if you read it in a completely different way, which is that what you would do if you really want to put your brain through the paces is that you would recreate the challenge of the clinicians who are taking care of that patient in real time. So you would do things like say, well, this is a 25-year-old man with a cardiac arrest, and then you would stop. And you'd engage in what's called retrieval practice. And you would say, let me retrieve from long-term memory the things I think might be responsible for that happening. Micro-challenge complete, almost always, you won't be as good as you thought you would be, but you'd be like, all right, now I know I got to get a little better. You keep reading and you learn he's in V-fib, that he's hypotension, that he's coming from South America. And then you might say, well, listen, now um, uh, he's South America, I remember you know, something about Chagas disease. And you may re regret, like, that's all I remember is that there's Chagas disease. But even that's a small retrieval. And then you say, I'm going to learn a little bit more, and then I'm going to carry on with the case. And you get to the neuro exam, and you say, do I remember the key elements of a coma exam? All of those steps along the way are learning points, but only if you read it in this really effortful way. And the principle behind it, I really, I love doing this. It's an effortful thing. It takes a pen, or these days if you're on a tablet, it takes a stylet. But it's completely worth it. And I always wondered, like, what was it? Because the truth was, I wasn't trying to upload a lot of rare diseases to long-term memory. That might be a side effect of uh, having a steady diet of case reports. But the real benefit I was doing was testing my brain through the concept of retrieval practice. And it's one of the most um, important outcomes of this new interdisciplinary science that's called the learning sciences, which is sort of this overlap between reasoning and memory and cognition and education that says, what is the way that we learn a concept? And one of the things that I've, I've been as guilty of as anyone else of is something that sometimes I say, oh, I know a concept because I understand it. 
but you don't really understand a concept until you have to apply it in practice. And all of us have had this experience. You might say like, oh yeah, I know a uh, blank topic, eosinophilia, but then you find yourself trying to teach it to someone. And as you open your mouth, you're like, oh man, I don't understand it as well as I thought I did. Or I read this thing many, many times in preparation for my test. I definitely know this. And then you're sitting there in front of that question on the test exam, and you're like, okay, teacher, you got me. Don't know it as well as I thought I did. And what the concept of retrieval practice is, is that we've spent so much time trying to figure out how much we upload into memory, thinking that you know the more times we can get stuff into the brain, maybe that's how it consolidates it. But the insights from a lot of studies, and these have been done in medical education, is that some of the best learning comes not from when we make the brain put stuff into it, but the number of times we make it pull out of long-term memory, apply it, and then reconsolidate it. And everyone knows this on some level. Every student learns at some point, like, I can't keep studying this. I have to go to multiple choice questions. Or I got, I've written enough note cards to really see if I know this thing. I need to start making flash cards and test myself. But that key concept starts to permeate like what something is in terms of a good learning activity. It may be that information comes in, but what you really want to do is test how well you are in pulling out that information. And fortunately now, there's tons of opportunities to do it. You know, you can get it through every single possible medium you want. If you want cases to test your knowledge, you can find it in your podcast, social media, your inbox, all of them come to your phone. They're all opportunities. Um, and I thought to myself, I was like, well, what is exactly as it does? Is every time you expose yourself to a case to one of these things, what is it doing to that flattening curve? And it turns out, the forgetting curve, and it turns out that that's been studied because what it does is it takes a case like this. This is uh, the clinical problem solving. It now comes as an interactive case in the New England Journal of Medicine, and many other ones do it as well. And instead of giving you the whole case, they put you through the paces. They recreate the challenge of the clinician. The patient comes in with this finding. You get a little bit of data, and then it asks you. It says, you know, what, uh, what do you think explains this? And as you can see, like all people, I get some of it right, I get some of it wrong, and it immediately delivers the micro-learning right then and there. I get a course correction, and then I move on to the next part of the case. That's a little more streamlined than that pen and paper exercise that I talked about with the weekly long case report, and it's a little more brain friendly. Now, to be fair, that also takes a bit of time. So you can look around and say, listen, I don't like that. I really love my Instagram. If you love your Instagram, I'd like to point you to figure one. So figure one is kind of like an Instagram for docs, where people just post images, very short quizzes, and you have the chance to quiz yourself on the things that are being shown to say, is there any way I can recognize them or take the small clinical snippet and just do it for practice? It's not perfect. It doesn't have the beauty of a peer-reviewed paper, but it's an amazing form of practice. And it takes two to three minutes to go through a couple cases and just quiz myself. Remember that curve I showed you before? It's just a compound interest thing, a little bit better um, every day. If you're like, listen, I love my newspaper on the weekends. Well, I do too. And if you uh, read Lisa Sanders, a really amazing column on diagnosis uh, in the New York Times Magazine, she presents a series of cases which you can enjoy, but I encourage you to struggle with a little bit too because you'll see how a patient who looked like flu over multiple, multiple visits can come in and eventually be found to be Rocky Mountain spotted fever or how a patient who comes in and eats meat and winds up having lip swelling is diagnosed by the nurse as having alpha-gal allergy. All the while, you're enjoying the case itself, but you got to put yourself through the paces. And if all of that takes too long, the, the, the web is now filled with multiple choice questions. If you want a quick quiz, you can take them too. But the key point for retrieval practice is that you can't look at the answers first. So to pull something from long-term memory means the brain has to generate the options first, and then you can see what the answers are. Because no patients walk into clinic saying, hey, I have five options I'd like you to choose from. Now, it's possible they might have printed something off on the internet and say, I have five options I want you to choose from. But most people are asking us to generate that. And if that's the case, then you have to replicate that in your own training program. And then to supplement that, like I said, the cases can come in every way, shape, and size. It need not be your phone. It can come through your eyes. It can come through your pen. And it can also come through the ears. Now there's an amazing suite of podcasts that you listen to. These are four of my favorites. I, I love many, many more. But in terms of my steady diet of uh, cases that are fed to me, I listen to the CPS solvers. Uh, that is a series of cases that are presented. And when they're done teaching you about eosinophilia or splenomegaly or elevated neck veins, they share a schema for how it's done. Core IM is a mix of interviews with experts and cases. The Curbsiders is more experts, but a little bit of cases along the way. And then I am Reasoning is uh, two uh, New Zealand internists who mimic the car talk dynamic, but they do it around clinical cases and clinical reasoning. And all of them are an enjoyable way to learn medicine while you're listening and almost invariably while they're laughing and you can't help uh, but doing it yourself.
And the key point about all of those exposures, as you try to think of ways to give yourself more and more micro exposures to cases, is it actually combats the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. So one of the things about the curve is that as you give yourself more and more exposures, it's not that you forget or you can, you can forget forgetting. You will always forget a little bit, but the curve flattens out over time. And eventually, your brain sees something enough times where it's like, all right, I got it. I got the hang of it. And that is the goal of your training program. Now, to make sure I have a daily routine, and I like to have a daily routine when I'm working through this, I have something that I do, and I'd encourage you from this whole menu of options to say, just what's my one thing that's part of my routine? What's my non-negotiable that I do? The thing that I like is uh, the Human Diagnosis Project. I have no role in it, but I'm a fan of it, because every day it presents me a challenge on my phone. It gives me a, a small case to go through. Um, I try to get the answer right, and I get some right, some wrong. This morning, if anyone did it, um, the case was very challenging. It was, on one level, it was easy. It was someone who had their their uh, thyroid gland taken out last week and they came in with spasms. I was like, I got that. I recognize that pattern. That's probably going to be hypocalcemia. So I was like, good. I felt really good about myself. They threw in a micro challenge where they said, okay, what do you do when you have hypocalcemia but the PTH level is high? You know, name five things that explain that scenario. And I actually came up short. I only came up with two or three. So I was like, all right, I have work to do to getting that better. And then there was an EKG where the patient had uh, bradycardia, and I sort of breezed through it because I was like, I got that. I see that that's bradycardia. And it was a total whiff because what I didn't recognize was that the person had a junctional bradycardia because of their hypocalcemia. And so I had note to self, I, I saw calcium and my eye originally went to the QT interval and I spent all my energy studying that and I totally missed that someone had an escape rhythm. So good on me, I made the mistake today on my phone, um, not with a real patient. And I think that's the way you have to think about this. If you set up these micro challenges, if anyone else did the case this morning, you probably have the same thing. This is what I feel like, right? Like some days I get the case right. <laughs> Some days you get the case wrong, uh, and sometimes it's sort of a mixed picture like it is today. But no matter what, um, whether I get it right or I get it wrong, every day I'm just getting a little bit better. And that is the whole principle um, behind this. <laughs> So as I start to think about how we bring this all together and what you can learn from all of these other fields have asked a question that medicine hasn't quite asked, but all of us are curious about. And I'm going to have you turn to your neighbor with this final reflection before I sum up the curriculum, is that every, everyone's going to be good here, but if you want to be great, there's, there's practices that we can learn from other industries or other professions. And I just want to summarize them in a simple way that uh, in terms of on-the-job learning, all of us learn on the job. If our patient demands us to look up a dose, figure out a disease name, uh, figure out how to work up something, we'll do that. That's sort of a moral requirement of being a physician. But do you have a habit of creating small challenges so that you learn on the margin even when you don't have to? Um, when it comes to all the patients we take care of, you can't possibly track them all. But can you go from what currently now is kind of a random system? We do get feedback from time to time, right? Like a friend may text you and say, hey, your patient's back. Or you may see a chart, and that gives you a chance. Or maybe you walk into M&M, and you see your patient being presented. Like there are, there are feedback mechanisms that exist. But can you switch from sort of the random haphazard way it goes to a true tracking system? And then if, if you trust in my advice that the, the greatest learning uh, program would come from reading cases, can you do that, but not uh, read them as entertainment, that they're not a spectator sport, but they're really a simulator exercise, and that you put yourself through the paces of the clinician, and that you retrieve knowledge from memory with that desirable difficulty, understanding that it's oftentimes not pretty, but each one of those times we retrieve, it's a chance to upgrade it, consolidate it, and put it back in for future practice. So as the last parisher exercise, before I do closing comments, turn to your neighbor and just say, which one of these things speaks to you? It might be easy to do in your practice, um, among your colleagues that you work with, or maybe the learners that you uh, lead. And say, which one of these things sounds appealing to you? This is not, uh, this is not a list of requirements. It's just a menu of options uh, if you are so interested. So spend two minutes with your neighbor on that.
All right, let's come back together. Um, like I said, this, this really serves uh, just as a menu of options that we can adapt from other professions where we've asked this. But I want to take it back to the single person. If this is a solo venture and you're doing it yourself, that I, I want to emphasize this is almost like a personal curriculum. And you can pick, pick and choose which parts of it you like. Like I said, I think my teachers in the, in the past, they said, see more and read more. And that was correct. Um, but how you see the cases is really important and what you see, what you can do from them. So at the core, for any one of us who wants to go on this journey, it is still our cases and the patients we see and we're directly responsible. Nothing will leave more of an imprint. But remember, we work in teams and we have a lot of colleagues around us. And think about the chance to do this. You know, when, you're, when your colleagues are working on things, there's, there's a two options. You can be heads down and I'm going to take care of my own work or you can be heads up. And be like, I'm going to listen for what's happening around me and get some of that learning out of it. Um, and then they, in every system we work at, there's a lot of great cases in the ecosystem. Sometimes it takes effort, like reading a memo, uh, the minutes from a meeting about cases, or making yourself go to a conference. But if you want to learn, the local cases is another source of learning. I was at Emory Midtown yesterday, and we did the open mic session, and it was tremendous. You know, um, Noble was one of the hospitals, and he presented a, a case of autoimmune hepatitis, and he did one of the he did the work. But 10 people in the room, including me as a visitor, learned. It was just a massive multiplier effect because we all chose to spend that time there together. Um, and then the last part, which is, I think, a, a key part of our training regimen and now has become more accessible, is that the number of cases that are accessible to us to learn from is infinite, right? And they need not be super long. You can do retrieval practice and challenging and uploading of new information in the brain with the quickest of apps and the, the easiest of emails or tweets. But that they have to make that part of your habit. But when you do this, this is a, a big curriculum that you can choose and pick part of. And if you look at this, I hope, I hope you look at this and say something uh, which many people do, which is like, this is a ton of work. And I said, it's absolutely right. Like, it is a lot of work. So uh, what exactly are we doing this for? And you do have to have motivation. If you study the expertise literature, and it's been studied in many fields, there's, no, there's never been a field, never, where people don't achieve their maximal potential with extra amount of work. So I'm not trying to stand here and say, like, this doesn't take extra work. My, my only point is, given what we do, um, is to convince you that it's worth it. And when you think back, sir, what are we doing this for? You have to have some intrinsic motivation to do it, because it's really our cases. It's the patients we see where we're going to do better, or we want to do better. And so we think about seeing them. We say, think about the case I have today. But trying to improve in this way is also about thinking about the patient I'm going to see tomorrow and really caring about them. Like You have to care deeply about someone to put yourself through extra work because our job is already hard enough. And you know you may have an affinity for your place or your uh, patient population or your panel on a personal level, and everyone has it. You know, I, um, I work at the VA hospital, and I, I love that place to death. You know, if you uh, walk in the front door, there's a sign, and it says, the price of freedom is visible here. And when you see that sign, it reminds you who's in those hospital beds and who you're trying to serve and why. And that gives you a motivation to do a little bit better. Or maybe it's the learners who are going to come to the VA hospital and try to learn with us. Or maybe it's the team that I have at the VA who are trying to give our very best. You have to think about not just today's encounter, but what about tomorrow's? And I was reminded of that years ago when I was working on these ideas and I presented at a conference and I was, you know, fundamentally someone stood up and said, yeah, that's all great, but that's just a ton of work and I'm super busy. And I was like, I hear you. I'm not trying to conceal the work. And people had reasonable oppositions like, listen, no one pays you for this. No one gives you a gold star for this. Um, and they were going on and on about it. And they were all fair uh, critiques about the modern world. Um, but then one of the uh, younger doctors, she raised her hand in the back of the room and she stood up. And when I was asking, why would anyone do this? And she said, well, listen, she's like, if there's any chance I could be a better doctor tomorrow than the one I am today, then I owe it to all of my patients to do it. And the room went silent, uh, and she took a seat, uh, and so did I, because I simply couldn't have said it any better myself. Thank you so much for your time and your hospitality today. Appreciate your attention. Thank you. That was terrific. I think we have time for one or two questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is this working? Okay. Apparently, it's probably working. Thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot, Goop. Yeah. Uh, that was really spectacular. the The question I have is: This seems really great for diagnostics, mm -hmm. um, and when I think about therapeutics, I sometimes think about, well, 
how do I mitigate this risk that out of all the things that I see when I'm looking for a difference of 1%, 2%, 3%, and, and then I see these outcomes of like, oh, well, every time I give my patient the beta blocker, they, they die because two-thirds of my patients are dying, and I don't see the difference that, oh, well, 35% are dying with the beta blocker, only 30% are dying without the beta blocker, but I can't perceive that in my no. mind when I'm, uh, and so is there a way to mitigate that risk, or how do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think I catch it. There's two things in there. One is sort of refining your diagnostics. This, this, some, much of this applies to your management decisions as well, because they relate to management. And I think what you were saying is when the numbers, when, are there times when my experience is insufficient uh, compared to the, what is a broader experience? And I think that gets at the challenge that when you do feedback, whether it's my diagnostic call or my management call, um, is there is a real risk that instead of learning, I will overreact or underreact, right? Like if I have two or three cases where this thing happens, I start to think like, oh, every time I give a beta blocker, this bad outcome happens, even though the literature tells me otherwise. Um, and it is one of these things about feedback that's probably best done with someone else. If you do it as a, as a group or with a coach or even with the literature, you oftentimes have a second triangulation on just my experience alone. Because I, I do agree the law of small numbers is such that you're going to get random variation and you don't want to respond to random variation. And if someone has answered this question in the literature, you have to have a lot of experience before you say, you know, my experience contradicts the literature. Is that what you were getting at sort of in that way? Yeah. I think you have to also have the insight to say, like, listen, literature is better than my three times this has happened to me. I'm on guard for it, but I trust that the, what the literature has shown trumps that, and I still go forward. It's a fair question. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank and you. we are here because we love what we do. We are <laughs> hospitalists, and I want to ask you something about our hospitalist uh, specific question. We are pressed to discharge patients early. We are doing extraordinary work within 24 hours, mm -hmm. and we don't have sometimes luxury to evaluate further. And many times my list, my patient list goes on and on, which you said, I save my patients, I'm calling them at home, but we are very restricted with time-wise. And you have luxury to have clinic, follow-up, you know, emergency mm -hmm. room, we do not. What, you, what kind of uh, advice you give us as a hospital providers in that instance when we couldn't really completely evaluate patient? Yeah, I agree. The, the throughput of the hospital is such that oftentimes we do like the bare minimum that needs to be done and then things are left for the outpatient setting or many, many tests are pending, et cetera. And I, that's a, a healthcare system problem, which I don't have an answer to. From the learning and tracking problem, I, I agree there's some things that are structurally a luxury, like if you work in a VA or a Kaiser where the EMR captures everything, that's one barrier that's dropped. So if you don't have that, I must say that sometimes there is no way to get follow-up and you know, it's, it's heroic to start calling around and getting faxes, et cetera. In terms of tracking, I would create a two-tier system in terms of who you track because although I hold learning in a very exalted uh, uh, stratosphere, there's one thing which is higher, which is when we have to track patients for their almost safety and uh, the right thing to do. So there is patients who I'm tracking where responsibility has really gone to another provider and I'm just watching to learn. Like I really, they're in great hands with ID, but I really do want to learn if the serology came back for that infection or the, the chest clinic is definitely watching that nodule, but I want to learn if it was infectious or malignant. Um, but there's other times where no one's watching. Right? There, there is no PCP follow-up that is scheduled, or I don't think the other clinician has the same concern I do. So then it's on my watching list because of the, for the patient uh, instead of me. And so I, if I was very honest with you and I said you have limited time, your first cut point should be the tracking that I do to make sure people are safe and that it is true that tracking for learning is probably a luxury that we can't all do. So I, I'd acknowledge that, but I would emphasize the difference between those two. It's a very real concern. Great. I think we've run to time. So thank you all for coming and thanks, Goop, for spending time with us. My pleasure. Thank you, Dan.